Good evening, Madam Speaker. Good evening to all the honorable members present here today and to appreciate the debate that has taken place that I feel is towards the right direction. I want to express appreciation for the way people brought out, vented their emotions, how issues were raised, the articulations, the fundamental issues that were brought in and the analysis of most of the issues that was addressed in the speech of the, his, of the President, His Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia. Democracy is really in practice. Democracy is what we fought for, and democracy is really being exercised. Thank you for that. I want to, ask, before I engage in responding to everything, I just want to refer to some of the constitutional, the constitution of the Republic of the Gambia. First to say that I'm not an expert, so I had to get the relevant aspects that I think are the uh, backbone and the foundation for our engagement and to bring it as a little reminder as we engage into constructive responses to the various issues that you raise that requires responses either now or those that are going to be taken further in the adjournment debates and sent to the ministries. First, I want to call our attention to the chapter one of the Constitution to remind us that the Gambia is a sovereign, secular republic. And the sovereignty of the Gambia resides in the people of the Gambia from whom all organs of government derive their authority and in whose name and for whose welfare and prosperity the powers of government are to be exercised in accordance with the Constitution. This is a very fundamental uh, aspect under Chapter 1, the Republic. And also to remind us of Chapter 2, the Constitution and the law regarding the supremacy of the Constitution. This Constitution is the supreme law of the Gambia, and any other law found to be inconsistent with any provision of this Constitution shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. So anything that we deal with that is not consistent with the Constitution is void. And I believe that some of the issues that are being raised that are not within the framework of the Constitution, therefore, should be made clear, are void. I also want to uh, bring in Chapter four, 6, that is the executive. You talked about the three layers or tires of the nation. You have the executive, you have the judiciary, the judic judicature, and the legislature. You talked about the autonomy of this, and the, but there are intersections. I want to remind you of the office of the president, that there shall be a president of the Gambia who shall be the head of state and of government and commander in chief of the armed forces. Then it says the president shall uphold and defend this constitution as the supreme law of the Gambia. So he is under the guidance statutorily to defend the constitution. I also want to talk about the functions and incidents of office with regards to uh, the issues that we have uh, talked about. Functions and incidences of office. That the vice president and secretaries of state shall be responsible for such departments of state or other business of the government as the president may assign them. In making such assignments, the president shall reward regard to the desirability of, the, of ensuring that such responsibilities are entrusted to competent persons with relevant qualifications or experience. So you will, uh, what I want to draw here, that it is clearly, the law is clearly stipulating people's roles, the three layers and tires 
clearly spelled, spelled, spelled out. So I'm bringing this context for us to understand the current situation that we are in. It also further went on to say that the cabinet shall be responsible for advising the president with respect to policies of the government and shall have such other functions as may be confirmed, conferred to any other, uh, uh, by any other law. I think as an entry point, this is very clear. And the executive powers, that is, executive powers that have been given, the executive power of the Gambia is vested in the president and subject to the constitution shall be exercised by him or her either directly or through the vice president, secretaries of state, or officers responsible to him or her. I want this to be clear. Then you come to the executive power and the National Assembly. Section 7, as indicated in his speech, says, Section 77 rather, the president shall at least once in each year attend a sitting of the National Assembly and address a session on the condition of the Gambia, the policies of government, and the administration of the state. I'm skipping number two and going to number three under that section. The vice president shall answer in the National Assembly for matters affecting the president, and the president shall be entitled to send a message to the National Assembly to be read on his or her behalf by the vice president. With this as my entry point, I am given the powers by the president together with the ministers to come here today to listen and address or respond as appropriate to the issues that you have rightly raised as members of the National Assembly who are representing your people and as members of National Assembly who are here to respond positively or otherwise to whatever is being presented to you by His Excellency for us to move the country forward. We are here together. We are here to move the country. We are here to bring in peace and to promote it and to see whatever we could do to make sure that the Gambia moves. So to that effect, I would like to now respond to some of the issues that were raised in terms of um, uh, the, uh, the issues that were brought in by the... You want something to say? I just wanted to observe, because I just wanted to observe, um, Madam Speaker, the Vice President said that we should respond positively. I think he should just say we should respond. He shouldn't direct us as to whether to respond negatively or positively. Thank you. Your Excellency, uh, Madam, Madam Chair, I think you misunderstood my statement. I am saying to respond positively or otherwise. I hope the language is clear. First and foremost, I would like to uh, um, say that my absence was not done out of choice. I want to first and foremost clear that aspect because I know I was present during the address of His Excellency the President to this August gathering, and with all due respect and recognition for the role he has played. I know I should be here to listen to you and take uh, respond to the issues. It was not meant to denigrate or to list respect this August body, but it was a coincidence that came at a time when the United Nations General Assembly was going and I was delegated by His Excellency to attend with my delegated delegation on behalf of the country. And at the same time, it was as a result of that I could not come. But before I left, I had intimated the honorable speaker that I was not going to be present. 
I did, did, I did, I did do that. And I want to apologize on my own behalf. If there is anything that we have done in terms of lack of appreciation of our role, it's not so. It was because of the exigency of service and the lot of responsibilities that were carried and plans that were put ahead before this, uh, the address of this speech. So I hope you will all understand, uh, you will all uh, recognize and appreciate the apologies for that. I thank you. I am now going to respond. The, the, let me explain to you the methodology of how I intend to respond to this August gathering. I want to appreciate the great thoroughness that you have given to this document and the issues that you have raised in terms of areas of concern for you and of, of specific concerns and general concerns from various sectors that you talked about. But I would also like to tell you that I'm going to follow a methodology that is going to respond to some of the issues. I've been guided by some of the technical people from the various ministries with their papers and responses that issues that you raised. That is one approach. And then I will give you responses on matters that I can give you from my fingertips and matters that I can progress. But I'll advise you as a matter of best practice to understand that I am going to follow up on each of these sectors to respond deeply, effectively, and efficiently of, uh, on the matters that you have raised so that you will have time to be engaged. Your subcommittees also might be useful for you to engage them to follow up on certain questions that needs to be addressed because it's about the nation. And if it is about the nation, we want to follow a process that is going to be very good for us to move forward and move the country forward. So these are the, the way, this is the way I'm going to approach it. Um, you talked about the standing order, of course, uh, to bring policies to his speech and so on. You talked about the diaspora and their rights to be voted for. In this, um, uh, 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 in, this, in this regime, we all agree that they played a very important role. We all agree that they were part of the chain, and we all agree that they are also Gambian citizens living abroad and bringing in as much. So it is, of course, part of the government's plan. The reason why the diaspora is the eighth region is in recognition of the contributions that they have done. And in a democracy, you must take cognizance of all actors and their concerns and interests in a way that will lead to progress of the nation. And that's the why the Gambia, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the government of Adam Abaro has recognized the diaspora as the eighth region. And all the issues that are raised in connection with their right to votes, access to information, access to documents, jobs, and so on, are all being addressed in the sense that the new constitution, remember, there is a lot of trajectory of things that are taking place. You all know about the plans that we have in terms of the constitutional reforms, the laws that are being are revised. You have the policies. You have all the, uh, all the commissions that are in place. All are in response to addressing the difficulties and the anomalies that we have inherited as a nation in trying to protect and move the democracy forward. We need to have some of those institutions, some of those policies and documents to give the new Gambia the feeling and touch of what democracy is really about. And I am very happy that some of you have made some analysis of the situation. And sometimes in those analysis, you answer to your own questions. The TRRC is there. You have the Law Reform Commission. You have all the, 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 the Land Commission. You have so many commissions going on that are actually building the blocks for a sound governance structure within a democracy that everybody will see themselves. And I believe even what has happened here today is one example of that. So the diaspora is being thought of to be voted for. I think most of you have already gone to, you have been interviewed, you have been required, you have been requested and asked by the commission, the Constitution Review Commission. Some of you must have been asked. If not, they will come to you because we as a cabinet have been brought in and we went on through a list, a long list of questions asking about what is required in terms of law 
and in terms of the Gambia future. And all these things were addressed. So the issues that you are raising now are things, are processes that are going on, and they are being considered in the new constitution that we will, uh, we are trying to uh, develop now. I want to ensure, uh, tell you that if you don't, if you are not interviewed or if you don't know about it, we will tell the constitution review commission to meet, engage with you. But I believe you must have done it. Yes, the Jamaica and its performance and the soft copy. We, we, somebody said that we should make it soft, the soft copy avail, available. It is a public document now. If you go to the uh, to the state uh, uh, to, to, to the to the to, to the office of the president's uh, website, you will find the state copy. The Ministry of Justice, I believe, is also going to have it as a public soft copy in some other sites. You can go there, find out because it's part of your duty to do so. To do so, to be able to get, you have to be proactive too. You don't expect the government to feed you with everything. We, will, we are doing our best and we are going to respond. We are here to work with you and we will do it. But go to the, uh, go to the Ministry of Justice, find out if it's soft copy. But I believe it's a public document now and everybody can have access to it. And you talked about the implementation of the report for selective justice. And that you said the president did not implement it. Uh, and there is need to implement the whole report, the recommendation of the report. These things have emerged from different speakers, if I get it right. And um, if there is any paper that is written or, or a report, the purpose of a white paper is to analyze or look at the document, look at all aspects, and come up with a view that we think will be in the common interest of the population and the people. It may be subjective, it may be objective, but when people are given responsibility and are given the chance to take charge, you either trust in them or do not trust in them. You cannot satisfy everybody. I am happy to hear that some of, most, some of you are saying the context in which the Gambia is coming, we all know it. When did we start? 26, 2017, 18, we are 19. 22 years of destruction, 22 years of impunity, abuse, exploitation, poor governance, weak institutions. How can a new government come and address this within a short period of time? How can we follow our hearts? If we were to follow our hearts and not to, follow, and not to be matured in the way we approach the things we do, we would have been at war. Some of you have said clearly articulated it here. Now, there is time, it is not my duty to tell you to forgive, but it is time for us to start reflecting where we are coming, what we have experienced, why people are engaged in order to protect the Gambia, to promote peace. You talked about peace. Peace is the hallmark, is the key word. Peace, progress, and development. If there was no peace today, none of you and myself will be here in this house. None of us will be here because we will all be refugees by now, or we are trying to see how best we want to spill out our anger or vendetta against each other. But I thank all of us for having agreed to fight our fight and make the change possible in a non-violent way. We still have to continue that spirit to understand the dynamics and see how best we are rendered. The Gambia belongs to all of us and we will never leave this country and abandon it. Whoever has done atrocities or have done good, we are Gambians. What are we going to do to learn from our mistakes and the circumstances surrounding why certain people did what they did and why others were victims? And today we are standing here with my colleagues in the chain to say the country must move. We, it's because we feel the Gambia is greater than all of us. And we all cannot be the same. So it is on that note that I am saying that the white paper that was prepared in response to the report was reflected upon very well and issues come, came. You may not know everything that is being revealed. You may not know what processes are going on because it's not possible to come and tell you everything until we reach conclusions with certain things. But certainly, if you have entrusted that responsibility to the government and we know where we are coming from, I think we should develop patience and also appreciate the efforts that are going on. Let us think of forgiving, 
let us make sure that there is justice, but we must also do it with, uh, with comp we, 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 in a way that will uh, move this country forward. Because the Gambia is everybody's, is bigger than every individual. Everybody has a story to tell, but we must forgive each other. We must be ready to, re uh, to, to tamper certain feelings so that we move the country. We don't, we don't allow it to slip. If it slips, we will not be here today. That's what I want to say about that. There were other statements being made that there were the taxpayers' money to pay the commission. How can cabinet decide on things and so on? Well, I'm happy that you have called each other to order in terms of the non parliamentary language. I don't know much about that. But the fact that you have called each other to address that is in the right direction. Because as leaders and lawmakers, you know it better than us. But I also think that there needs to be some level of appreciation, some level of understanding that we all inherited a very difficult situation and we are trying to address it together. We cannot do it alone, you cannot do it alone. Neither can anybody do it alone. We all have our roles. All the three arms of government have a big role to play, but we have inherited a lot of problematics, a lot of issues, and we have to start reflecting and being creative and innovative about what we do, and that is why. So the way we um, address uh, people in position of responsibility which we have given to, I think should be um, tampered with, I think, respect and recognition of the fact that we are all trying to bring in the good of the nation. Uh, his, uh, somebody said His Excellency mentioned about women and children, and the information is very flimsy because it was tasked not only, only mentioned the Ministry of Women and so on. Yes, you see, all the debates and the activism that was being done concerning equality for women and vulnerable groups was advocacy level. Was mobilizing, talking, and raising the noise, which we did very well, all of us. But what this government has succeeded in doing is to surpass anything that has ever happened with regards to promoting equality and empowerment and recognition of the vulnerable groups by the creation of the Women, Children, and Social Welfare Ministry, giving it a status like any other ministry and giving it all the political and financial and everything support to make sure that it happens. You need a political will to advance equality and human rights, and the president has done it. So for the women, this is the greatest achievement and the greatest uh, uh, dividend that this chain has brought for 51% of the population because it is only through the Ministry of Women, Children, and Social Welfare that all the cross-cutting issues of gender, women, and vulnerable groups are going to be addressed with all the other departments. So it is a strategic will, a strategic effort by the president to recognize the importance of women in this democracy. So it's a big gain for all women of the Gambia. So for us, it is not task. That's where the policies are going to be. That's where we will be calling accountability of all ministries we will be looking at the laws, whether they are gender sensitive or gender responsive. When we look at policies across the ministries, we, they will be able to find out whether this has been addressed or not, from agriculture, health, education, to all other aspects of development. You're looking at it from the security point of view and so on. So that ministry is already fulfilled. All the commitment we have done in terms of rhetorics and translating some of the conventions and the protocols that the Gambia has signed into localizing it for women to realize equality and empowerment. That is something that needs to be clear. So that's a very big achievement. Um, because gender is a cross-cutting issue. 
And it is also an issue that needs to be taken seriously, which has been given. So forever in the Gambia, I don't think women will have to start fighting to say, but we are not recognized. It's how we ensure that those things are implemented within the ministries because it is already there now. So we thank, we should, we should appreciate that. And it is during your time. Because, uh, climate change and environment. Seeing the private, uh, to get the private doing a lot less, um, to get the, uh, the climate change environment and, and uh, to climate change to be addressed, seeing uh, getting the private sector to do a lot and also contribute is very key. Now, when you talk about different forms of engagements, you have the public-private partnership, you can do the BOT, you and all, all, all sorts of, because I am not the expert on it, but I know that private sector-led development is one of the policies of the country, and we want to engage and encourage the private sector. We must also understand that the private sector, during the last regime, suffered a lot. They suffered so much so that today, when we work with them, we begin to realize also the amount of abuses, the amount of sufferings that they went through, and we have to encourage them. Because if we're talking about sustainable development, the private sector has a key role to play in our development to move this country forward. And therefore, because we inherited a difficult context, they were also a part of the context. Whatever may happen, we have to go along with it and look at their special circumstances, empower them, work with them, agree with them, so that they would be able to, um, to help and move this economy and the country forward. Health as a human right. Yes, human rights. If you look at human rights, the principles of human rights, the indivisibility of rights, participation, all the aspects of rights are key, but you can never attain them at the, at the same time. It is the ultimate goal, but you can only att attain them when you have a systematic approach to it, when you are able to put together the resources and also try to put in place the structures and the instruments and get the right support to be technical, financial, and also the policy, the, the political support to make it happen. We had lost human rights. All the issues that we were raising with regards to rights about health, the health ministry has been existing for the past 22 years. The Minister of Education was existing for the past 22 years. Other ministries, water is a right. There are so many plethora of rights in the country, and this government is recognizing it to the point that it is putting it on paper and even in the Constitution. That shows us the commitment and the conviction and the readiness to engage, to promote democracy. So in doing that, we have to take steps by steps by steps. We cannot happen. You cannot say yakun kun fa yakun. It can never happen. Not for human beings. Especially when you have found the structures destroyed, you have found the basis on which the, the democracy should stand on, the institutions all being weakened, even the flight of intellectual ability and skills all gone. If we want to do that, we have to make sure that these step-by-step -step, uh, systems are put together. We agree, I agree with everything that you said in terms of the lack of them. In some places, we are getting just a little bit of them. Some we are starting, but the effort is being done by this government to ensure that the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is to reach to the highest peak. That is the aim. So I think everybody has seen what we are doing in terms of this thing. The budgets are increasing, slowly but surely. But remember also that there are competing needs. This comes a question of priority. Human rights, fundamental freedoms, liberty, democracy is a key issue of this government, and that's why we are engaged in all these things. And you can see even in the debate how issues are being brought in. And it is of good information to get some of this information so that we will follow, we will find out, we will be able to engage. And I believe that it is your responsibility and our responsibility, including the judicature, to respond to all these issues in our different ways. That's why we have the three arms of government. And when we come in, into this, gov into this hall, it is no longer about our personal political interests. It's about the country. And you have said it very well. That is a fact. It's about the interests of the country, the people who actually entrusted you with their strength, their powers, to come here to be able to deal with their issues to talk about their issues. But of course, 
Accountability falls on everybody, on, on, the, on the executive, on the legislature, and the judicature to ensure that we do it right or we are able to do it. But you must also recognize the context in which we are coming, that financial implications, all these have financial, technical, and technical uh, implications. If you have the political will and the financial and the technical uh, uh, opportunities are not there, it will not work. So these three things have to go together. And we are challenged in some way or the other by one or the other or both. How do we go about dealing with them? It's what we are discussing now in, uh, in, in some of the things that uh, we're talking about. Yes, I was the Minister for Health. Then when I went to the, uh, when I went to the health sector, we have done an assessment with the committee on, uh, with the subcommittee on health. And I want to say thank you once again for what you have discovered on the ground. It was not coming from the Minister of Health. It was coming from first-hand information, from your investigations, from your reaching and contacting the structures and the people to come up with these issues. When, we came with the, when you came with the issues, I did not deny anything because I did my own rapid appraisal and I agreed. Because I understood the fact that it is not because the NAMs were not doing anything or the government was not, but we inherited it and how are we going to fix it? We came with, uh, with a discussion. And that was when the budget was increased because of the fact that there were Herculean problems that we have discovered and we have to fix them. Some can be done immediately. Some cannot be done immediately. It requires processes. You don't get a doctor in one year and say they have. You don't get a nurse in one year. You don't, you, uh, you don't get certain type of competencies within a short time. And therefore, we have to plan. When you talk about the new Gambia, it's not about only promising and doing things, but there should be a plan and procedure. We want it to be a good institution. We want it to respond to the needs and aspirations of the country, but it has to be based on processes, procedures that will finally make us reach there because we want to make sure that it is sustainable. So these are all problems that the health sector has inherited. Paracetamol, I am not saying what you are saying is not true, but I know that by the time I left, there was supplies for two years. I want to underscore the importance of attitudes in our institutions. Maybe certain things are happening, which were also discovered at one time and reported, and we were addressing them, habits die hard. We need to have robust monitoring and evaluation mechanisms or follow-ups, and maybe with this information that we have had, we will do our best. The Minister for Health is a very, very pragmatic person and readily available, and he's doing a lot. I guess you must understand that a lot of things are being planned for the health sector. There is improvement indeed. I want to confirm that there is improvement indeed because I know. We are improving, but we are yet to get there. But slowly and surely, we will get there. But we need the concerted efforts of people. We have philanthropists coming to give us support. That is appreciated. Under the education sector, you've been talking about the MRC Foundation Holland. It is a foundation, but it's supporting the Ministry of Education, basic and secondary education. We have been working with the foundation as a government, looking at our priorities for them to support us. We also have other foundations and philanthropists who are coming to help us build different facilities for different sectors. So let us not isolate what is happening within the broader framework, separating it from other initiatives that are being done because they've seen confidence in this country now. They have seen a protected institution and they are ready to invest their resources. Therefore, it is about the government. We appreciate all the philanthropists that are helping, but it is the government that is facilitating, that is creating the enabling environment for them to engage. So when we analyze, let us analyze it from a developmental perspective and not to do it in a, in a way that seems that people are taking responsibility for us. We are pleased to work with anybody and everybody in moving this country, and we want to thank the foundation, as you have rightly said, in promoting this. They've been doing a lot, but others have been doing more, and that's fine. So let us appreciate it and make sure that they do more, and then the government will look more. In the, you talked about resources. Remember, we did not find much in the, and we don't have to repeat it again, because I felt we have analyzed this. We've talked about when Barrow came in as a new government, 
how much uh, money that was there, one month, less than a month. Now we have up to four months. There is progress, obviously, serious progress that is going on. We have increased the salaries by 50%, and the pensions by 100%. We, we need more. We always need more. But let us appreciate the, where we are coming from. We sacrificed a lot to make sure that the people we promised are going to do. And it's all of us who are doing it. So let us appreciate the little strikes, the strikes that we are making because of the nature of the state that we have inherited and the situation and how difficult it is to know. If we appreciate that, then it will be easy. But if we don't appreciate what we are doing, Rome was not built in a day. And it takes one step to make 100 miles. So what, that's what we are doing. We have to be realistic in the way we do it. And this is what the government is trying to always, His Excellency will tell us, let us look at what is in the best interest of the country and do it realistically. I can attest to that. You talked about sports. We are very proud to be associated with the success of sports in the Gambia now, because sports has been an old uh, sports in the Gambia. And we have seen what has been going on. But recently, we have seen the resurgence of success, not only football, but in all other forms of sports, athletics, wrestling, and so on. And our athletes go out there to win. That's a pride. Maybe one of the analysis I could give is because there is steady minds. People are happy. They can sit down and practice and do something. And then when they go, they will excel. But if you are living in a situation where in, there is in a state of fear, you cannot expect to, uh, to achieve anything because you are, you, you are not sure of yourself. You've lost confidence. So we, are, we appreciate that there is a lot of effort being done. There is a levy that is being put up that will support sports. And there, is also, there are other projects that are also coming in terms of sports infrastructure. Now, the sports infrastructure requires resources, building the stadiums, state of the art, Bringing in uh, equipment and all these things are all part of the plans that are there. And maybe the various committees that are relevant to the sectors I'm talking will be able to go and find out more and then see how you can follow them and get the reports to move on forward. So we are proud. The president actually did a great uh, thing when we got uh, some of our young Gambians perform very well. It is the state of the economy. It would have been greater. But it's the beginning. We're going to get there. There is an anti-corruption bill. I guess you all know. There is an anti-corruption bill. Whether it has come to you or not yet, it was drafted. It was part of the issues that we raised during the campaign and to promote democracy and to address any kleptocracy in our government, to move the country forward. And the bill, whether presented now or not, it will be. You will see it. There are other fundamental issues that we have to consider when we talk about um, we, when we talk about submitting a bill at a particular time frame. Remember, it's not only going to plagiarize because there was an existing bill, so we go there, look at the bill, and just put in one or two and say you try and um, improve on that and bring it. We are not throwing out any document, but we will use documents as our point of reference. You cannot do anything without doing literature review. But you can't, you, and, and but context change, and you have to pitch your work within the framework of that context to respond to the needs. Why are we thinking of anti-corruption bill now? Corruption is a very old, it's a very old uh, practice. And you know the biggest corrupted person is the former president. You have seen in the TRRC, you have seen in the commissions, and all these things that happen. Nobody raised the issue. But we felt, as a democracy, we have to take the bull by the horn and address it. Nothing was said. So the issues that are being raised here are fundamental. We agree with you, and we are responding. Is the, there is a bill. But it has to go through due diligence, due processes, and the people who are sitting on those are not machines. Currently, the Gambia is overwhelmed with capacity. We Gambians are very intelligent. We are even bringing in others to come and help us to respond to the plethora of materials and promises we have made in terms of improving the laws. We have consultancies going on. We have Gambian lawyers. There is no Gambian lawyer now who is, who, who, who is, who, who is uh, left 
uh, to idol. A lot of work is being done to the point that they are overwhelmed. Then you have other people, intellectuals coming in, the technocrats. I have seen, I may be right or wrong, but this is my perspective and observations. Technocrats must be given their due recognition and positions. Technocrats are the engine of institutions. Technocrats move the institutions. That's why when, they, when we have all the laws and places, in things in place, we have to make sure that they are accountable and all of us are accountable. But to castigate them the way that we are talking about the technocrats, it makes people fear. If you consider yourself a technocrat and you say, I'm going to be part of this chain, you start thinking of yourself to say, I better go and look for something else. So I am urging this August body to please understand the context we are coming from, to understand that these pro pro problems that we are done and are happening that we have inherited are affected by various factors that all of, some of us know and we may not know all. So I believe in a difficult circumstance like this, technocrats have a very big role to play, a key contribution to make in supporting whatever we are doing as the executive, this legislature, and the judicature in our various ministries. So we will work with them. We will try as much as possible to make sure that we learn from each other and try to pave a way that will bring us a better Gambia. Somebody asked for technical guidance to discuss the document in terms of the statement by the Environment uh, Ministry uh, regarding the agreement. That if it is laid down, they would need technical guidance. I think that's fine. We have to do that. And we wanted to find out also if there is a, whether, whether a particular company is a Gambian company or not, and that we must give opportunity to Gambians. Of course, there is a policy for what they call local content. In this new dispensation, we are taking on board and looking at the context we come, came from in a way that will not say, uh, we are going to pick from X, Y, and Z. You need a policy document. And I think a policy document is developed with regards to local, what they call local content. That is recognizing the agency of Gambians, either they are business people, or whether they are technocrats, or whether they are institutions, or the, what they can offer to the country. Give them, recognize them, in as much as they cannot do it alone, but they are giving prominence in whatever we are doing. So the issue of local content is there, but also it is important for us to understand that in as much as we talk about uh, local content, it's not that we want to give uh, the jobs or the assignments to foreign bodies or foreign institutions to the point that some of you are saying Gambia is not for sale. We are not selling Gambia. We are not selling Gambia. What we are doing is to see how best we can support our country with the support of different actors whilst we give agency, primary agency, to our people, with the recognition that we do not know it all and we cannot do it all, so that we will be able to move this country and give it the standards and the quality and recognition it requires, because no one state can be isolated. The world is a global village, and we have to make sure that whatever we do, we look at the best practices and imbibe them to move this country forward. We have to adopt an efficient management and administrative system, both the local government and the central government to work in harmony. Exactly, that's what is needed. And I think that's where we are doing that. The local government, I want to tell you that the local government has responded to some of the issues that you have said. And what they are saying is to the point that, um, that there is a lot of efforts that are being done and uh, there are, the laws are being, uh, the policies are being processed. They are, work, they are working on the laws are being worked on and that they are trying to see, looking at the context, to make sure that the local government and the government itself, this, uh, this, and the decentralization process is put in the right context. You know we have been talking about decentralization for a long time. When the president talks, he talks about decentralization and he has started it by first and foremost making a practical implementation of decentralization when it comes to road infrastructure. 
I don't have to tell you more because you have talked about it here. The bridges, the roads in the URR, and other institutions that are coming. We do not have all the resources at one go to make sure that simultaneously, that's not even possible anywhere in the world. I challenge anybody who feels that it is done anywhere in the world, that they have enough money to respond to all the needs that are being raised at the same time. It's not possible, but we have to give priority. We have to deal with systematically, and that's what we are doing. We are leaving no one behind, but we also need to understand our strengths and our uh, opportunities to be able to harness them and make sure that we move. There is a lot of cry here and cry with regards to that. And uh, I'm telling you that at the local government level, when all this comes out, we are not interfering. There is no interference. Some talked about Banjul as the capital of this country, urging for, this, um, uh, for the sale of properties that needs to be protected. You see, we have to understand the dynamics of development. We are coming from the Land Commission, and the Land Commission, there were, uh, we all know what happened. People's properties were, were, were seized. Now they are returned to them. I don't have, or you don't have any right to say that if I want to sell my property to X, I cannot sell it. We can advise. You see, in a democracy, we have to understand certain procedures and understand what people can do. We can talk about protecting the environment. We can talk about protecting the landscape, that certain areas are zones that should not be built on. There are certain areas that we cannot destroy the fauna and flora, but you cannot stop people from selling their properties. I want that to be very clear. You can find guidance to tell them, your first chance is to give it to a Gambian. If not, a non-Gambian comes in, and he or she fulfills all, why not? This is democracy at play. So protecting uh, the properties of Banjul is left on some of the issues that the state has a role, a duty to do, and the relevant institutions through policies to be able to do that. Uh, but like you said, we have to also be aware of the dynamics that are evolving. Coalition 2016 was to institute, institute, institution, institute reform of our laws and institutions. The Republic, uh, uh, what I want to say here about Coalition 2016, I think has been clearly articulated um, to look at the context that people came together to form the coalition and the trajectory and the historical development of coalition 2016. I don't belong to any party, but there were parties existing that had their collisions, many different types of collisions. But 2016 was unique, very unique, when individuals, parties, groups, interest groups, all forms of diversities came together to form the coalition. But in everything you do, there will be leaders, and I want to recognize the role of the parties. You've done very well. I want to recognize that, but I was also a player, and I did not belong to any party. And there were other players also. So that this collective energy that brought us together, whether as frontliners or supporters, is very key in recognizing the contributions of everybody. Everybody did it, but there must be leaders and frontliners in whatever you see. People happen to be the frontliners. But it could not have happened without the collective energy of everybody. And I want to thank all Gambians for that. Having said that, the coalition is considered dead by many people, but still we fight as the coalition government. And in the government, when it was set up, all members of the parties except Doi was present in that, in that cabinet. That's true resemblance of democracy, people making choices to be part or not to be part of it. I was also contacted and I wanted to be part and I was even advised to be part. And I felt it was my country. But that doesn't mean that because Doi was not there, they are not committed to the country. It's not so. They are. Because they are playing a very key role here today and they are existing and likewise all other parties. For those who were 
in the cabinet. Because now, constitutionally, the president has been given the powers by the elections that were run, and he was made the president of the Republic of the Gambia and sworn by the Constitution. And therefore, it is the constitutional mandate that he is serving. This was discussed in cabinet, the first sitting in cabinet, this was discussed among us. We said, this is the first thing that was tabled. And we said, let us discuss this. We have come out of this. We've been using the three years as a tactical strategy to get the people together so that we remove this, uh, uh, this dictator. That's what we said. And here we are now, let us agree, because three years, definitely, is not the concern there. We may run into crisis. There was nobody in that cabinet who said no to the five years that was presented. Nobody in that cabinet who was present did not say no. All of them said yes. And you have heard even comments after that cabinet meeting, people saying that if we want to, uh, uh, if we don't have five years, we will be taken to court. You've heard about it. So by our own cabinet, by the cabinet that is there, and we, what, we, what was agreed upon, we have, it's going to be a constitutional crisis, so we have to go and speak to the other members of the coalition, particularly DOI. That was what was said. And one, uh, somebody was delegated to call a meeting of the coalition. We throw the matter to the, uh, to, to the coalition members so that we debate it. No matter what may, let us respect the constitution and inform the population ag accordingly. This was done in cabinet. And I stand to be challenged by any cabinet member who was there. It was done in cabinet. And the president allowed us to debate, to discuss, to move the forward this thing further. And he said, I am here to serve the people. You have to decide. But we did that. So if things have changed and people who were part of that decision-making process are not taking the right or giving the right information, it raises a fundamental question of crisis. That's why I, am, I don't want to delve much into it. I was writing everything, and it must, if, it is, if the handsets are properly written, it will be there. So the issue of the Constitution, and you have rightly said it. You have rightly said it. It's the Constitution. So the population must know that the information they may be given contrary to what has happened in cabinet. This is what is there. I am a witness, and I'm here to serve the country and the Gambia under the leadership of His Excellency President Barrow. I am here to, to, to validate that. I was part of it. So Gambians, you should know that. There is the issue of raising. I know when we discuss, we have a lot of issues coming, a consultancy to mapping, somebody's requesting a kind of mapping of the laws affecting women, and so on. These are not new things. These laws have been there because if you look at it, during even the time of the dictatorship, we were talking and reminding the state of why women should be given equality status and empowerment. Because the Gambia has ratified conventions, protocols, and instruments that promote equality for women. Since 1990, or even earlier, just to remind the state. But if there is resistance, and there is no recognition or respect for the fundamental freedoms and liberty of the people, you don't grant them that because you are sitting, you, are, you feel you are, you, you, are the, you, you are powerful. So it's not new. Those laws have already been there. You have the Female Lawyers Association. You have Gamco Trap. You have all the other organizations, Institute for Human Rights, the different institutions in the Gambia who are non-state actors, who were actually part of that process and uh, have been pushing the agency, supporting the state. So they are there, and uh, what is there is now for the Women's Bureau to put them into a compendium, and even that has been done, to make sure that we refer to them and make sure that it's a guiding document for people to move. Uh, to, uh, to move. So the reforms that we are going to deal with is going to look at how we do we situate those laws in the context of the Ministry of Women and so on, and also to use it as a guide for other ministries to recognize that it is formal equality, and now we have substantive equality, and therefore the both should go together. There is a policy going on with the health. There is a lot of reforms going through the Ministry of Health. 
I want you to understand that a lot of things are going on. Let us accept and understand the difficulties that people have. In a post-dictatorship, in a post-dictatorship, if you don't believe in your country, you don't last in any institution. You will work out. Because you find everything there that is fragmented. Everything is destroyed. Even to look for certain papers, you find it difficult. Or people start doing practices that they think are normal when they are really abnormal. That is what is happening currently we are facing in institutions. Things that are not within the framework of the law or civil service procedures, we do them thinking that these are normal. So we have to start constantly reminding ourselves of what is, is this the law or is this something that was uh, enacted just for the sake of enactment? You remember this constitution was revised 52 times. 52 times. So, uh, uh, one of the documents. Now, if that is the case, one of the legal documents or they did coming on and out, you bring you host, host, bring people together, do it and enact it just because you want to fall on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 a, on a party leader or on an intellectual or a person who is not towing your line. This is, that was the basis of governance. So in such cases, you cannot come and say those documents are going to, this, they have to be revised. Policies are about 10, 15 years old. Nobody dares talk about policy revision. As long as it doesn't fit the, this thing, yes, we can change those. But those that you know are for the best interest of the population and the people, they were not taken account of. It, is, it was for one individual. Institutions were are not allowed to function in their, in their, on their own using procedures. We all know that. And these are things we have inherited. There are certain ministries whose mandate has a lot of things, but because of the fact that they were not empowered or they were not allowed to do so, they cannot do anything and they were lying there. So years have gone by, the context has changed, circumstances have changed, therefore we have to do things. We are also not able to do certain things because we have failed in fulfilling our statutory obligations internationally and therefore we are cut off. And ministers, you all know you travel, you know what I'm talking about, and other uh, technocrats who are given the responsibility have to go and start negotiating. And I am happy to recognize the fact that the assembly has been recognized and even waived some of the fees that you are supposed to pay as your statutory obligations. Those days it was not happening. So you know because of democracy that this is happening. So I wish to congratulate the speaker for that. Then water also is a human rights issue. You need drinking water. I am telling you that the plans that we have is to bring water to every nook and corner of the country. The relevant ministry is working on that. Some of the pipes you see laying, some of the, God knows the quality of the water. Some of these things, even roads are running on them. There is need to do a lot of work and a lot of work and efforts are being done. You don't just say today I'm going to give you water and say, okay, let me make sure that the water reaches there. You just take a pipe and put it here. You are obstructing a very important part. Feasibility studies have to be done. Assessments have to be done. Surveys have to be done. A lot of plethora of activities have to be done to be able to come up with the right type of intervention. But if we want to just say it must happen here and there, at the end of the day, we will be accountable to those coming after us. So we are not refusing. Also the resources that we are giving, some people are saying that we are supposed to be depending more on ourselves than on grants and aids. That's the ideal. That's the ideal. But I want any one of you to show me all over the world which country is depending only on itself without working on grants and aid, looking at low-hanging fruits, concessionary loans, or certain technical support. Nowhere in the world. Nobody can say that. So if that is the case, the Gambia it's a special circumstance. It's a special aspect because we have inherited difficulties. We don't even have the money. We don't even have the, 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 all our brains have left the country. We are trying to pull them back. They've been enjoying better salaries, better conditions and over there, but here it's not there. Who told you that I don't want to be paid 25 million uh, thousand dollars or any other technocrat? But we are not doing that. We are coming because we saw the Gambia and we want the Gambia to move. So grants are part of development packages. Any country can take it, 
What is important is not to depend on it too much. You can use those grants as a stepping stone to get out of the situation you towards sustainability. That's what we are saying. Without grants, we would not have been sitting here today, uh, I'm telling you, because there are so many things that are happening because of the grants and the concessionary loans, well, including also the masses, the small masses and recognition of the democracy that we are nurturing and the peaceful way that we have effected the change, that people who believe in, believe in the principles of democracy, human rights, fundamental freedoms, and liberty are saying we have to help this country because there is hope. We have to tell a different story for Africa, and Gambia is a great opportunity for that. Gambia is a great opportunity for that. What do we do? We have to work hard and muster the difficulties, take courage, and address them because we can. We have the brains. We have the people, we have the commitment, and we have the leadership. Who is committed to listen to the people, to make things happen? This is the reason why we should. And to say that we, can, we, we, we are working towards sustainability. We want a Gambia where everybody can go out into the market or do anything with your own money without even asking. The salaries that you are talking about, we have done our best at the moment. We are looking at allowances. We are looking at allowances when others don't even have a good salary. We are looking at allowances when people don't have a good salary. We are asking for increases on certain things. Now, if we're talking about justice and fair play, we're talking about democracy. We, rice is the same cost for me and for the for, uh, uh, for the for, for the night watchman in the hospital, and I am earning more. And many other in disparities. We, everybody needs money, but the Gambia as it is right now, we have to think about how we move the country, taking it from that dark threshold to a comfortable level where everybody will navigate what you want. If that is the case, nobody will be a minister. How many ministers? We are not earning up to $1,000. Contrary to what we used to get. So these are some of the issues that we have to, we have to give in. We have to give and take. We have to understand. There are certain privileges that have been cut off. Things that are by law to be given or by policy. But it is not taken. But we don't have to say everything because it's our country. We all have a role to play. So raising some of these fundamental issues are very key and important. But Gambians must understand that these issues that are being raised are key and important. But the way we found the Gambia and the coffers in the Gambia it's very, very, very poor. It has been said and it is heard. We will do our best because the Gambia is at heart. This government has the Gambia at heart and is going to do it. Yes, there are certain strategies that are being done. Um, somebody talked about electricity. It's to solve the problems and leaving no one behind, we are doing that and we will continue to do so. That's the mantra. The goal of the SDGs is to leave no one behind. And I think we also are adopting that, to leave no one behind. We all suffered, so we cannot leave each other behind. We will try as much as possible, but it has to be systematic. We have to move from one step to another. And we are trying. Within two years, going to the third year, look at the amount of progress that was done and the amount of move that we have done, so on and so forth. The foreign affairs, yes, we are downsizing. There is a lot of downsizing going on um, for various reasons, to save money and to maximize the opportunity, where one mission can have extra uh, 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 plenipotentiary responsibility, can take care of other countries. These are all things that we are thinking of. And the foreign ministry, if you want to get more clarifications, as a look at the committee, the committee responsible for that can go and get further issues, but indeed that is happening. Um, and that somebody talked about the, the saga of the diplomatic passports. It is, we have recognized that, and I think a lot of things are going on. There is currently cases going on. Some of you have revealed, I don't know where you got your revelations, that the name, list of names are given. We are now talking about confidentiality and professionalism and ethics of work. The issue is raised, and now you have access. So we start looking at among ourselves. Are we doing the right thing, or should we look at each other and find out? 
before you start publishing people's names, you've not found them guilty yet. Why do you have to get those names? They are, these are assumptions until they are proven right. But we are recognizing the issue. And a lot of issues are being said with regards to that. So we will do that. The matter is under, uh, under uh, uh, observation. And we are not keeping quiet or pushing it under the carpet. We are very transparent. And we are going to um, follow the rules. You talked funny counselor begins with uh, making reference to his address, uh, address in page six regarding uh, achievement, uh, regarding achieving of the government between 20, achievements of the government between 2018 to 29. Uh, the speech which has highlighted almost all the aspects. The need to assess the level of implementation, not only for the achievements and the challenges also. Yes, you see, in a, in a lighter mood, when you talk about challenges, you don't have to come directly sometimes. In the conclusion of His Excellency, you can see the issues that are being raised there are about challenges that we are facing. And in a very literal, beautiful, literary way, he is trying to use this as a positive engagement with the population. There are many things happening. We may know some, we may not know others. Because we don't have that capacity to know everything. And we cannot bring everything in a speech. But the fact that, that there are issues are raised that are of concern, some of the issues, not all the issues, you see, paper never refuses ink. You have to read between the lines to get the meaning of those issues. The fact that His Excellency has mentioned those issues, it means there are other issues that are left behind, which are also challenges. So those are the ones that you have brought to our notice. We will take note of them. We appreciate it, because this is a parliament of democracy. The issues you have raised, we will look at them. I've taken notes. Some of our technocrats have taken notes. And a lot of things is being recorded. So we will have time to reflect. And the various uh, ministries will do their best to respond to some of the really things that are pressing and, uh, and then address them. And if possible, come back to you and say, these were the issues you have raised, and we are going to this thing. And you must understand also how governance works as the body that makes the laws, you have absolute rights to have everything presented to you. But it's not everything also that has to be brought before it is ready. So the issues that are brought to you are issues for which statutorily you are supposed to address and those that may be of concern to you, you can dig it out more. When I engaged with the Select Committee on Health, etc., they collected a lot of information and they got a lot of documentation from us and we are still working with them in matters of the bill, the disability bill will be presented very soon. It was during my time, but it has to go through due diligence and processes and procedures. It was presented to, uh, to at one level and they said do this, do that, it goes back. Then you have to follow these due processes and so on. So those things are going to come and as I said, the, the, the technical uh, competencies that are needed have to get to be, have to be right. It's not anybody who will come and sit down and do certain policy documents for me to accept, no. It has to go through due diligence, through procedures and processes so that it stands the test of time and the issues that you are observing in terms of quality and standards. To do that, you have to engage. It's not easy to come with a good paragraph of law. You have to do a lot of, uh, imagine the amount of consultations that are going on. So these are some of the things also we are, uh, that are being done in terms of uh, policies, in terms of these things, and also to know that all these sectors in this country are now going through a transformation. A transformation that is supposed to build the legal basis, the professional standards, the quality, and the assurance that when people leave, institution will still remain and be intact. This is what we found missing. And as we said, never again. If we want to really address 
and make sure we got the democracy. We have to get it right. And we are not all endowed equally. And because we are not endowed equally, those who have the opportunity to lead those processes are human beings. And they need to work diligently to do it. But also, it's not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. So I want to appreciate those who are engaged in these reforms and to thank them. His Excellency thanks them for what is going because if they don't do it, we cannot even deliberate on them. The policy idea is there, the fractions are there, but they have to put it in a way that we will all appreciate and identify it with it. Then that's why when you look at the report, you can bring in the issues, which, are, which I appreciate, because you have something to feed you. That's the information in that. That is what you have, so that you can come with your critical analysis, which is good. So that's the way it, it happens. So the policies that are going on is going, uh, it's, it's across the countries, it's across the sectors, and we are doing our best to come to you at the right time. Time is of the essence, I agree with you. Time is of the essence. We must try to fulfill, we must try to engage so that we are able to meet the deadlines. But if you encounter constraints that are beyond you, there is bound to be some lapses. But we must improve on what we are doing in terms of time, and I agree with you but also appreciate the fact that the context is very hard. You talked about the creation of senior secondary schools in the Combo South uh, to access education. If we talk about education and as a right, I don't think we should raise questions about why this and not that. What we should raise is, is everybody getting it and how? Because where your right ends, that's where another right begins. But we also have to prioritize. We also have to look at the architecture. We also have to look at when schools were built before, where were they concentrated? What about, why were others not given the equal opportunities? So we have to look at all that thing. It's not about, it's, it, when we talk about um, policy and when we talk about interventions, we have to understand certain things and the dynamics in which these things happen to be able to uh, move forward. Uh, you can, the Minister for Basic Secondary Education will be giving this information. The, uh, they will get back to you with regards to, the, to, to it. The issue of higher education, why, uh, what plans does Gambia has for the Gambia College? These are very uh, pertinent questions that are being raised. But I know that a lot of effort is being done to improve. I also had, there are stories that we are saying, but I also had that when students are asked to leave the dormitories so that the place could be made, some of them don't want to leave. These are stories coming from authoritative information. So what is there why students are being so recalcitrant to help them better their conditions and they are refusing to leave? You see, there are certain fundamental issues and things that we have to gauge in a chain. Chain is, a, is one of the true things that is, 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 is constant. And no matter what may, it will take place, and it will always be taking place, and it is on a continuum. We are here today, maybe tomorrow we will not be here, all of you and me. But change will always continue. Now, when the change occurs, you have to gauge the vibes, you have to gauge the situation, you have to gauge what are the dynamics that are taking place why is it that I want to bring you this good and you are resisting? Why are you not appreciating what I'm doing to help you move and you are resisting? And why don't you want me to do it? These are all dynamics that do come. So that the Gambia College is a very important institution, one of the citadels of knowledge, and which the Ministry of Higher Education recognizes and isn't even putting it under its policy of reforms. We've been talking about the need for STEM, science, technology, education, and mathematics, uh, 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 engineering and mathematics, STEM. The whole, we cannot afford to leave ourselves behind. Do we only want one university in the Gambia, or are we looking for many? We should improve all the existing institutions and upgrade them. We should uh, aspire to have more universities 
Because the demand is there. The awareness is there. The resources may not be there, but we have to plan. If we plan and package ourselves properly, we will be able to move. Nigeria has how many? Ghana has how many? Senegal has how many? And many, many others. There are many. So let us not look at our size and think small. I want us to think big. So to come up with another responding to that, and if a donor is available, who says if you are going to imbibe this principle of this system that we want to introduce, which will be good for your, uh, for your country, we will. It is true that you can develop others. You know, we have to be prudent, we have to be strategic in the way we do governance and how we plan, how we engage. Sometimes something comes, it blows out because you need to have research, uh, in, in, uh, research, uh, uh, research units. All education of, uh, institutions of higher learning should have research units. They should. Those who've been to university and completed, you know what I'm talking about. We have to. So it's a question of, yes, we have challenges. We've inherited the challenges. We know that the University of the Gambia is not fully, 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 but it's functioning and we are proud of that. We need to improve that. If we have a STEM university and other faculties coming up to catch up, we have to leapfrog. Gambia, we have been left behind for 22 years, two decades and two years. We have to leapfrog. We don't have to be crawling. We are exposed to a lot of opportunities. The world is clapping and opening its hands to us. What can we do to capture them and consolidate? These are some of the things. So, what we need to do, the way of thinking, influencing ourselves, Somebody came to me and, uh, can you talk to one of the ministers to go and uh, push your, your unit to talk? So the, the National Assembly, I said, I will not talk to any National Assembly member to praise me because I'm the VP and managing those projects. Let them say what they want to say, say and we engage constructively. And I believe none of you here, I have not spoken to anybody. Nobody here can say that. Because I believe it's a democracy and people have rights to do what they want to do. I don't want to feed you. I want you to say constructive, critical analysis that will help us see ourselves and work and improve them uh, and look at it. But I will not come to any one of you to say, please talk this about me. <laughs> no way. So I expect that you as lawmakers, you should come up with this and this is what you have done. We will discuss. That's why I'm trying to respond to you to explain to you why it is need for us to link, think critically and leapfrog and not to crawl. We are beyond that. Then um, we know that um, we talked about the issue of the transformation of the family to an infantry battalion, how, how uh, convenient is the family members, uh, and so on. Well, we may have people with their houses or compounds this man has put, brought, brought in the security forces in every nook and corner. Compounds were made detention centers. People's properties were taken, and they were taken out and made into this thing. I was in Holgam. I have gone to the different places that I have been detained. And these are things that are assumed to be compounds. You only go in to see the horrors and dangers of it in there. Change has come. How do we innovatively think about how we blend with the security forces? You have civil military relationships. They are not our enemies. Somebody has made a demon out of them, if we all agree. If we do not agree, there were atrocities done because of the context and circumstances. They are our husbands, our friends, our mothers, our sisters. And these are people who are serving the nations. But if the leadership and the leader of governance does not respect freedoms and fundamental rights, you are likely to degenerate your own population. That is what happened in this Gambia. 
Populations degenerated, individuals degenerated to something else. If the TRRC was not out for us to hear some of the revelations, it would be dangerous. But thank God, to the democratic processes and procedures that are taking place, the Gambia is using democratic institutions, institutions and procedures to make sure that we respond to the very difficult situation and circumstances we have inherited, to the fact that we don't have to point each fingers to each other. Not everybody will be able to reveal in the TRRC, but we must all be accountable to the situation we found ourselves and be ready to engage constructively with it and to live in harmony and peace. I heard you talking about peace, and I felt very happy. You talked about harmony. You talked about love. You talked about many things, but I'm going to also add forgiveness, because I've not had forgiveness from you. It's a democracy. We want to address and manage the situation. People have right to explain. Here we are. It takes me to the next step. Fonyi is feeling that they are left behind. They have complained in different ways. And it's a democracy, they have right to say so, but it's a democracy also to say that the whole Gambia was denied water and light when they were enjoying water and light. Rice was free when it was not free to us. And it's in the same country, we are all Gambians. But the truth is, let's forget. Let us forget. Let us not bring in ethnic sentiments. I heard about ethnicity. I don't believe in that. Let us forget that discrimination, what was going on was beyond that. It is not about tribes. It is not about individuals. It is about the style of governance, the dictatorship. Those who understand what I'm talking about know it was the dictatorship that has created that to the point that there were ways of governance that were excluding others over and above others. But we are not going to tolerate that we have to do the right thing. We have to do the right thing. The right thing is we are here as a government to represent the voice of the people, the will of the people, because they have given us the mandate. So therefore, there is no room. There is zero tolerance for discrimination. There is zero tolerance for discrimination. We have to allow people to express their agency. And I think that is something we are seeing. We have to people to belong to where they want to be, and we move on. We need to allow people to do, and that is what, exactly what we are doing, and to engage constructively with each other. Let us not fan the embers of tribalism in this country and in Africa. Let us not fan the embers of tribalism and pushing in discrimination, discriminate. let us please, let us not do it. We are too young. We are emerging from a very, very hard time. And the revelations that have been made in the TRRC is enough for us to be open and embrace each other. Let us embrace each other. It's a very extraordinary situation in this country. Let us love each other. Let us appreciate each other. Let us try as much as possible and protect this chain. And it is us, you and we, the legislature, the executive judicature, who should be shining examples of this. Because trust is being reposed on us, particularly this August body, to represent the polity, the people. Once you were brought in, everybody did everything they did in the elections. You are here now for the Gambia. You are here only for the Gambia and the interests of the Gambia. And the government is supposed to sue the interests of the Gambia and move the country based on rules of laws and terms of engagement. That's what we need to do in this country. So I want to demystify. I want to also urge and appeal to all of you to please let us not fan embers of hatred, embers of tribalism, embers of self-pity. The country belongs to everybody, and that has been clearly articulated by all of you. If the country belongs to anybody, and there is a democracy, I don't see, I don't see no reason why people should try to fan that type of rhetoric. Let us avoid it, because tensions are high and we want to pull them down. Let us not. Please, let us forgive. We, there are people who suffered. 
to bring this change? Who went to prison? Who were detained? Who were denied all sorts of things? And who had to follow and sacrifice their time and energy to move this country to where it is? And it was because we saw the Gambia and we saw what was. That was why you had the coalition. There was nothing like, but you, nobody was cross-cutting. The way I, what I saw there is so beautiful. That's why I want to thank all of you for what you have done. We all have to appreciate that. And those who have inherited the legacy of this change and have privileges and opportunities to assume responsibility and positions, let us tread with caution and work hard so that we remain longer to enjoy, to be able to serve our country, to be able to serve our people than creating scenarios all of us are sitting here because there is peace. If there is no peace, nobody will be here. Maybe some will not even know where to go. So let's pray to Almighty Allah that this change has occurred in a non-violent way and we are here today in our parliament trying to make it right. You were talking about the state developers. There is, um, I want to say that the state developers are working under a law. Sometimes, if we take time to read what governs particular, particular practices, and I want to say I'm, um, I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm, I'm just finding myself into governance of this type as a human rights activist. But I read a lot. Anything that I want to go in, I am guided by that. I, I try to look at what are the statutory requirements, what are some of the policies and procedures, and I ask questions. I don't go with any assumption, because even if I have the assumption, I want to prove it right, I go out to find out. And I don't feel big to go to anybody who I feel has the institutional memory, has the capacity, or has the relevance to know what is happening, and I do a lot of that. So when we see developers doing certain things, let us try to find out what framework are they working in, and then that's the framework you want to go and find out whether this, what they are doing is in line with the framework, and if it is not in line, you raise the issue. You blow the issue. So that whatever we do has credence, and it will not create any tension and accusations and counter accusations, because I know from where I am taking it. So we must, appreciate the effort they are doing because these developers are also part of the ecosystem of the chain and of the governance. They have to work, there is their work. But also there are procedures that govern that. Find out whether the land that they are selling or the lands that they are surveying was given to them by a family member, an alcalo, a chief, or from the relevant institutions. Find out that. We all know that they are at contestations regarding land in this country. And this is not something that was created during this regime. It's a very long crisis, and it became worse. Can you imagine somebody having 286 pieces of land? Where would you take it? Taking it from the people. If, he, if the leader does that, what about the others? And people were abusing the system because of its weaknesses and selling family land to others, or denying each other community land. These are the facts on the ground. How are we going to make sure that these issues, difficult issues that we have inherited, can be tabled in a way and addressed that will not create crisis? We are all the time probably saying there will be crisis. We are doing this. I understand where we are coming because uh, the language of how we respond is all about vengeance, control, and so on. Let us not. Let us address things following processes and due diligence. When the Land Commission came, we said these lands are being forfeited to the state. But those who feel that their properties were taken unlawfully, and you can show proof of this, please come and present yourself. Take your lawyer and go to the law courts. Going to the law courts is the most appropriate thing to do, or when you can negotiate out of the courts, that is your choice, whichever way. But to say that telling people to go to the law courts is a procedural matter. So the law courts are not there to create problems. They are there to make things right, and they are there to help us and guide us. 
So let us not see certain institutions as creating tension. It is not. Even this August gathering is guided by law and procedures. You have the standing order. You have the orders for the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature. So you also have laws that are coming for institutions. And if you feel your rights in a rights-based approach or in a democracy where rights are very key, you have to follow the due process. That's what we are saying. So the way we think and analyze certain things, the way we put it maybe in the paper, and the way we interpret them depends on our own viewpoint of what we assume when it is not so. So these are ways of trying to give everybody the opportunity to establish uh, your rights over a property or whatever. But the land issue is a problem, and we are addressing it. There is a policy going on. The law is being reformed. That process is going on. All these processes are going on. By next year, every document will be there to guide you. Now you will say, this is what we want. So that's why we must give chance for these things to happen and let them go. We can criticize constructively in order to help us improve or to help the sectors improve what they are doing. Because it's all going to come back to you, but we got to get it right. So the, 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 the regulations of the estate developers, it's not that we should regulate it by arresting them or by taking them to court. That's not our duty. Our duty is for us to follow the due processes, and people who feel that their rights have been infringed upon should follow the right procedures. That's what the democracy is all about. Uh, You, people talked about why should um, others pay money as a result of the commissions? Why should we uh, talk about uh, Jame and his associates? Then, if that is the question, why do we have to change? Because Jame has right to be. We have to understand Why the change and the country? As I said, change is on a continuum. People come and go, but institutions must remain. We got to a point where everybody felt it was a moral duty to engage and remove the dictator. Now to say we are going to deal after him, the issues that he dealt with after him, should not be done, then we are contradicting ourselves. We are contradicting ourselves. We have to hold the bull by the horn. And if we want to take measures to, on everybody, then nobody will be left <laughs> if we really follow the procedures. That is the reason why it is not about selective justice. It's about reflecting carefully on the report. That's why the president did not just say, I'm going to do this. The president gave it to the appropriate relevant institution to come up with a white paper. And in that white paper, certain things were done. It may not be perfect, though, but this is a process that we have taken. And as a house, you have rights to raise issues. You have rights to raise issues. I'm not denying you those rights. But also, we have to understand that we have to take certain steps on certain issues. Maybe, if you ask me, how do you feel? If it is me alone, I will forgive everybody. Everybody. Because there are people I'm speaking to and I'm looking who are part of my arrest. But the fact that I have fought and removed the dictator, I am proud to stand here today and rectify some of the wrongs that the former dictator did. That is what I'm going to give to the Lord Almighty. I'm not asking for a dime from anybody that will say, come and talk, I'll give you something. I will not do it. Let me tell you one thing. We can negotiate the recommendations based on fair play, like you said. But that fair play does not mean that what we are doing is wrong. It's not wrong. Like it is said that these issues are open to discussions. But we cannot let everything go like that. Then what is the use of the commission? What is the use of the TRRC? 
What is the use of all these reforms that we are doing? And so on. So there are ways and means of seeing how we go. But we must also understand the dynamics that people emerge from and see how we can negotiate to be able to mellow down some of the recommendations to a point that we, it will be a win-win. And that process is, is going on. So I appeal to you. Uh, we will look into it. And uh, whatever is done in cabinet, we all stand by it. We talked about the electoral rules um, to be ready before 2018. Uh, before 20, we said we were going to get them ready before 29, before the end of 2019. The laws, uh, were, uh, we have to understand it's a process and we are going to do our best. I can assure you to see what we can do. Some of the drafts are ready, but and they have to be tabled. They have to go through processes. These are thick documents. To read it and understand it, at least you have to find time with all the other works that are coming. We'll do our best. And I can assure you, uh, we will fulfill our mandate. As some of you are saying, yes, we said this, we said that. It's easy for you to be given a paper to read, but the, cre the architecture of that paper requires processes. So let's appreciate the amount of energy that is put in.